Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here for the Rheumatology Pulse annual CME. Uh, this year, as you all know, with the ongoing COVID pandemic, we have had to go virtual, uh, hoping to go one-to-one, -one, face to face uh, the next time we meet. Uh, but we have uh, an splendid lineup of uh, speakers and topics for this uh, meeting today. Uh, this, uh, as we can see, almost we are 100 participants here right now for this meeting in this Zoom platform. And there are a few people watching it live on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the participants. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the esteemed faculty for this meeting. First of all, uh, API for bringing this uh, CME to all of us. Uh, Professor Bomsab is here, the chairman of API Udaipur chapter. Professor D.C. Kumaut sir is here. He's the honorary secretary of API Udaipur chapter. Uh, so what is the theme with the rheumatology pearls? Uh, we have a theme where we discuss the interface and the basics of rheumatology, arthritis, as well as the other autoimmune diseases uh, with the physicians, uh, the pediatricians, the orthopedicians, and the other aligned faculties where we have common interfaces with. So what is the theme uh, this year? This uh, year we are going back to the basics. The three most common problems that we see in the clinic are polyarthritis, monoarthritis, and low back pain. Uh, I'll uh, welcome uh, uh, Sir later to discuss this. And um, before moving on to the next session, I'll just uh, tell you in brief about the program. We will have back-to-back -back three talks and then we'll take the questions uh, regarding the three talks. Uh, and before I introduce uh, the faculty and we start the session, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Kumawat, sir, to please introduce the theme for this uh, year's Rheumatology Pulse. Uh, Dr. Kumawat, sir. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. Kumawat, sir, you are muted. Okay. Yes. Okay. You are able to listen? Yes, sir. Sir, please introduce the theme for this year. Okay. Good morning. I must uh, welcome Dr. Mohit for his uh, wonderful, uh, exhaustive means uh, work to conduct this virtual CME during this uh, COVID which we are facing. Again and again, I congratulate Dr. Mohit. So today we are here for this uh, virtual CME. Uh, back to basics means, uh, you know, for one year, Probably we have not seen so many patients, only virtual doing. We have forgotten so many things. We have remembered it again and again. So we come to basics. The basic rheumatology is concerned with mainly with the joints. So in this CME, we are going to listen about monoarticular problem, polyarticular problem, and a very common problem is low backache. So Dr. Mohit uh, invited a international distinguished speakers for this virtual CME. I must con congratulate. I welcome the speakers and are not taking much time. I hand over mic to Dr. Mohit for conducting this CME. Dr. Mohit, please, thank you again and welcome and all the best. Thank you so much, Kumar, sir, for the many kind words. And as we were discussing before this meeting started, there is no probably subspecialty of medicine which is more closer to internal medicine than rheumatology. We have all kinds of organ involvement. We kinds of all we have all kinds of manifestations. So probably uh, rheumatologists are intern and internists are the people uh, who need to work the closest. And uh, so we'll start here. The flow of the program is that we'll first have this uh, three back-to-back -back talks with our faculty. Then we'll have a panel discussion where we'll be discussing. DMARDS uh, you, during surgery, pregnancy, and lactation. So the three talks we have in quick succession, the first one is the approach to a patient with polyarthritis. Uh, for that, we have an esteemed rheumatologist from Chennai, Dr. Sham. Uh, he is a consultant at uh, Glo uh, Glen Eagles Global Hospital, Chennai. Uh, for the second talk on monoarthritis, we have doc Dr. Raj Kiran Dudam. He is uh, from the Hyderabad Rheumatology Center at Hyderabad. As, and as we said, he is also the organizing secretary, secretary for the next national conference of the Indian Rheumatology Association. And uh, for the third uh, talk on low back pain, approach to low back pain, we have with us today Dr. Himanshu Patak. He is the consultant rheumatologist at Tricolor Hospitals, Vadodara. So without uh, wasting much time, 
uh, i would here like to hand over the uh, proceedings to the next speaker the first speaker dr sham uh, you may start uh, sharing your screen and begin the presentation sir Oh, it, my screen is visible, right? Yes, it is visible. Oh, it, uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so, good morning, one and all. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the APA Udaipur chapter and Mohit for uh, uh, letting me to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, session, concentrating more on basics of uh, uh, how managing a patient with uh, musculoskeletal problem. So without wasting much time going into the topic. So the, my topic will be on uh, how to approach a patient with polyarthritis. So anybody with uh, five or more than five joints, we usually call it as polyarthritis. Um, so usually a single joint is mono. The next topic will be on that. And then in between, you have something called oligoarthritis. So whenever we see a patient, we see whether the patient is having a peripheral joint symptom or an axial symptom, somebody who comes with the pain. So since it's polyarthritis, I will be usually uh, basically... Hello? I will be basically... Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to request uh, uh, everybody except Dr. Sham to kindly mute their uh, microphones. Oh, yes. Uh, I'd, I'd like to request every, everybody except Dr. Sham to kindly mute their microphones. Yes, Dr. Sham, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Mohit. So coming to the peripheral joints, so the joints which are present, both the small and large joints in the upper limb and lower limb, uh, those are the ones we'll be dealing with. So when we see a patient, we see whether it is the peripheral joint or whether it is the axial. Axial means we refer to the spine. So once we are uh, uh, considering uh, which one is involved, then the next job is to see whether it is going to be inflammatory pain or whether it's going to be mechanical pain. Because these are the two causes. One is a, a sort of degenerative wear and tear thing. Another is the inflammatory one like, like rheumatoid or psoriatic or any other inflammatory arthritis. So this should be the first classification. So see whether it is an isolated peripheral joint or sometimes it can be isolated axle or it can be both. Something like a psoriatic arthritis where you can both have peripheral joints and also the axial joints being involved. So first find out what is the main syndrome, then you go, can go for the specific disease. So this will be a most important thing. So whenever next time when any of us, we, if we see a patient with joint pain, uh, first let's try to find out whether it's an inflammation or whether it's a degenerative. So the typical, you must have seen any rheumatologist asking is whether they have a morning stiffness. So after a period of inactivity, particularly overnight, it's a prolonged period of inactivity. Once we get up, we have that stiffness. At least half an hour, uh, if not even one hour should be there. So with movements, uh, the stiffness comes down, the pain comes down. This is a very typical for inflammatory arthritis. Not only the morning stiffness, even if the patient is going to have nap in the noon time after a period of couple of hours, they will get up with the stiffness. So next will be, initially there will be stiffness, then there will be frank synovitis, what we have joint swelling. Uh, if it is a larger joint, you will be able to appreciate warmth. In case if the patient is doing well with rest and only on exertion, if he's going to have pain, then that we call it as a more of a mechanical pain. So once they exert, they have pain. Once they take rest, they do well. So something which shouldn't happen is uh, <clears throat> a progress stage of uh, osteoarthritis or like a stage three, stage four, where we can find crepitus or it can go into deformities. Remember, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, this is more of a patient with osteoarthritis, but remember, any patient with inflammatory arthritis can also have features of osteoarthritis. That will be the more challenging part. Patients whom see on a, like a long-standing duration, we should be able to differentiate whether the patient is having an inflammatory pain or the patient is having a mechanical pain. It might be even a tennis elbow or it might be a OANE. Because if it is an inflammatory pain, we have to step up the DMARDS or whatever uh, drugs we are giving. If it is going to be a mechanical pain, it is going to be more of a strengthening exercise or uh, other uh, modalities like physiotherapy. So that is more important because for a mechanical pain, if you are going to keep stepping up the uh, drugs, it might be harmful to the patient. So coming to the history, we always ask the diurnal variation. I'm not going repeating it. That's what the morning stiffness. Then always remember all polyarthritis may not be a simple rheumatoid or psoriatic. There is a group called connective tissue disorders like SLE, scleroderma or Jogren's. So ask for some subtle things, whether there is any fever, oral ulcers, hair loss. It might be even a some very subtle thing like a weight loss. We see commonly in MCTD or scleroderma or hyperpigmentation. Uh, so some subtle things, if you ask, you can look for those things and do think of connective tissue disorder. Uh, also ask whether the patient has other coexisting skin conditions. Many times they might have some other autoimmune skin condition, commonly lichen, uh, 
complex like that or the patient might have psoriasis uh, many times patients think that is different and arthritis is different or any history of red eye like a patient might have inflammation so just go and screen for extra articular manifestation then of course this is the basics whether it's a female where we think more in terms of a rheumatoid jogrens or other connective tissue disorder or whether it's a male where you think in more in terms of a spondyloarthritis or gout and of course again age if it is an young patient or middle aged we think more in terms of inflammatory whereas if it is old we think more in terms of a degenerative condition so history of other autoimmune diseases is very important as they told patient might be a thyroid many times uh, the rheumatologist will be seeing for rheumatoid whereas the physician or the endocrinologist will be seeing for diabetes and thyroid so we all know one autoimmune disease there is a very high ch chance of the patient getting one more so always if if i see a patient with a joint pain in a, somebody who doesn't have any other autoimmune disease or somebody who has autoimmune disease then i will be double careful to make sure the particularly in the person who has autoimmune disease something like a hypothyroid uh, so that i am not missing a autoimmune inflammatory arthritis so history of other autoimmune disease is very important and of course similarly family history of the same illness or autoimmune disease again that will also have a bearing to uh, suspect so coming to the pattern of arthritis starting from the left uh, so these are the some of the common conditions so the starting from the left this is a typical rheumatoid arthritis so based on the joints involved we do suspect what the patient might have you can see the classical pap the mcp joint involved the wrist elbow so this is the small joint involvement and another thing you can see is the they are symmetrical so anybody with a symmetrical uh, with predominant small joint both in the hand and foot think of rheumatoid here the next one the very close mimic many times we see is something called psoriatic so uh, uh, in practice it may not be the same like what we discussed but in general psoriatic it starts with being asymmetric in uh, rheumatoid you see this we call a row pattern in the sense all the digits are involved uh, uh, side by side uh, thanks mohit uh, then whereas here we call it as a row pattern it's a one single digit you see the mcp pap dap unlike here where it is next neck it's more like a horizontal pattern here it's more of a vertical pattern this is we call a ray this is a uh, sorry this is a ray and this is a row uh, so asymmetricity and uh, one more thing is if there is a sacroiliitis always think of spondyloarthritis even in a patient with polyarthritis so the next one the third one is uh, i think you, you can see definitely there is a uh, much of inflammation in the spine so it is more of a typical ankylosing spondylitis usually don't get small joint involvement in ank spond or a typical polyarthritis you see get to see the root involvement Uh, so you see the root joints means the shoulder and the hip so these are the root joints which are involved ank spond so the last one is nothing but osteoarthritis this is very important any patient in rheumatoid many times they complain of pain in a first cmc joint many times it might be just a simple osteoarthritis similarly in the leg like a first mtp joint so just remember rheumatoid it's more of symmetrical small joint hand and foot uh, psoriatic similar like rheumatoid there will be some asymmetricity and bit of axial involvement Uh, ank spond is more of axial with root joint involvement not much small joint osteoarthritis definitely small joints can be involved so in ra we should be careful whether it's ra or oa one more thing is dip involvement in practice either it has to be osteoarthritis particularly it's an elderly or if it is an inflammatory in young people think of psoriatic so dip it has to be either one of these two uh, dip in the sense distal endophalangeal joint uh coming to just summarizing so see whether the patient has a frank swelling synovitis or it is just simple joint pain so we call it either arthritis or arthralgia whether it's a inflammatory or a degenerative whether it is acute uh, or chronic so uh, something like a monoarticular like a gout or crystal arthropathy may might be in acute or a septic usually these ones are like oh. sub acute or chronic in nature whether it's intermittent like episodic Uh, something like a gout or some form of infections like Lyme arthritis, or it is additive like a rheumatoid, or it is migratory like a rheumatic fever. Symmetrical is symmetrical. We dis uh, uh, discussed even the pattern of joint. Same. So all these things only we just saw in the previous slide regarding the pattern of arthritis. So these are the common causes. Many times common things are common. We see a lot of post viral. Uh, it might be a post chick chicken gunia arthritis, or even sometimes any non-specific viral illness. Um, uh inflammatory uh, we always see it's rheumatoid or psoriatic and osteoarthritis so these are the common groups of course uh, we do see so always uh, we should also remember the rare ones but always think about the common ones first so coming we'll have few case discussions so here we had a, a young male who had a typical inflammatory polyarthritis uh, uh but his inflammatory markers were negative rheumatoid factor anti ccp ain everything were negative he had gone to multiple doctors everybody told he doesn't have an inflammatory arthritis so uh anybody wants to share the views maybe you can put it 
chat box so anybody wants to uh, comment on this you can so this is a patient who has a typical history wise inflammatory arthritis in rheumatology always the history is very important uh, clinically also the patient had synovitis but none of the blood tests contributed so you can see there is a pap synovitis in this patient so we did go for an mri sorry this is actually a more of a t1 than a t2 so but definitely you can see there is a synovitis ideally you would have had a t2 where this patient had bone marrow edema and minor erosions so the take home message from this slide is elevated esr crp is usually found in inflammatory arthritis but normal levels doesn't rule out inflammatory arthritis so only the clinical picture is important either you can go ahead and treat the patient see the response by 3 months if not if the patient is willing and is able to afford you can directly go for an mri and prove its arthritis so majority of the patients 80 to 85% will have elevated inflammatory markers but in zero negative maybe around 10 to 15% the esr crp might be normal sometimes in spondyl arthritis the percentage is even more they don't always correlate so esr crp does helps but not always so just this will be the take home message uh here is a 30 year old male uh, with a uh, duration of one year uh, he had a history of joint pains uh, there was heel pain uh, morning stiffness uh, he had a one right second toe which was fully swollen so he basically has arthritis whenever we see somebody with plantar fasciitis or achilles tendinitis we use something called enthes so when we see enthesitis always think in terms of a spondyloarthritis uh, group of disorder so is inflammatory markers were elevated is uric acid also elevated somebody had outside done an ana not sure why it was done so in this patient mm -hmm. uh, anybody wants to Namaste. anybody wants to take a call can put it in the chat box Kal so as i told there is, since there is an enthesitis ah. always think of spondyloarthritis ah do uh, so yeah. this patient on probing further he volunteered that he ah, had no. Ah, yeah. So this patient was a case of psoriatic arthritis. So always look for hidden areas of psoriasis in any patient, particularly patients with inflammatory arthritis who are negative for rheumatoid factor and anti CCP. So because patients may not think this might be related to their uh, joint symptoms. So zero negative. Always think of psoriatic arthritis. Ask or look for hidden areas of psoriasis. Another take home message is elevated uric acid levels doesn't mean it's always gout. it can come in patients with psoriatic arthritis it can be seen in a patient with simple metabolic syndrome many of these patients have lot of comorbidities sometimes in rheumatology of course in medicine we always have the uh, unexpected things so we should also be prepared for that not just the common things so this was a elderly female with uh, diabetes and other comorbidities fever followed by polyarthritis uh, so inflammatory markers were elevated initially the rheumatologist first rheumatologist made a, made a diagnosis as a post viral fever arthritis a uh, patient was discharged but she came back again with fever sugar levels are fluctuating uh, so she had a, she was almost bed bound generalized fatigue uh, severe polyarthritis still the inflammatory counts were elevated she also grew some uh, organism in the urine so we thought it was most like a infection uh, maybe the post viral polyarthritis so all the investigations the immunological or relevant investigations like anca ferritin ferritin particularly for avsd we look so all these things were negative then the second rheumatologist had seen this during the second admission he again had put it as post viral lora means late onset rheumatoid or reactive arthritis all the other work up were done it was normal ct thorax was done which showed bilateral upper fibrosis it was done as a part of po work up and his calcium her calcium levels were 11.2 any takers anybody wants to guess at this time so here we have patient with diabetes maybe a uti polyarthritis uh, her calcium levels are high so usually in rheumatology whenever we see the calcium levels high we do get excited uh, because uh, we have a condition called sarcoidosis where we do see hypercalcemia hypercalciuria then with this bilateral upper fibrosis and the calcium levels, we then went for a serum she didn't have any uh, mediastinal nodes uh, only thing was just fibrosis her ac levels are pretty much elevated and we had diagnosed it for as a sarcoidosis so we also have to think of the rare things of course it may not be as common as a rheumatoid but sometimes when things are not really uh, fitting into it there is no response to its treatment i also always have a relook into the diagnosis it might be a rheumatological issue or sometimes even uh, arthritis can be a man manifestation of non rheumatological issue so here we have a young female with multiple joint pain um, she was uh, uh, in her college so even her academics were getting affected 
no other symptoms like uh, fibromyalgia was there history of suggestion of irritable bowel syndrome was there she was pretty anxious parents were anxious again multiple tests uh, everything is negative everybody told uh, that she is normal uh, so any young females with a polyarthralgia yeah I, uh, so any young female with a polyarthralgia always think of something called as benign hypermobility syndrome this is a very simple thing you can just do the particularly the 1 2 1 3 in the bedside particularly young females who are pretty lean if you check they just have this something called benign hypermobility syndrome so many a times these patients go through unnecessary investigations they might have some false positive ana uh, they immediately think that they have sle so always think of benign hypermobility in a young female with polyarthralgia they have to just do some strengthening exercise and uh, proper counseling they do well so always remember this in a daily practice it's pretty common once you start picking up for this uh, in our daily practice so that will be the take home message from this slide so here we have a elderly female uh, who with uh, more than 2 years chronic additive pain multiple hand joint pain so look into the age it's a chronic additive one uh, esr and crp are mildly elevated the other inflammatory markers were normal uh, so she didn't have any morning stiffness it was basically more with activities so elderly fame with more with activities no morning stiffness so i think you might have got the diagnosis you can see this is a typical osteoarthritis more of erosive osteoarthritis you can see the uh, the dap distal interphalangeal joints being destroyed so this is a typical case of osteoarthritis in a uh, elderly female so always common diseases are first definitely osteoarthritis is pretty common remember inflammatory markers sometimes can be elevated even in osteoarthritis that doesn't makes it as a rheumatoid or any other inflammatory so there is something called inflammatory oa or erosi oa where these can be elevated uh, yes can somebody uh, mohit if you can just please remove the ra pa as no the markers yeah i i think uh, that since you have written from the presentation i think you will get the option only you will get the option to remove okay mohit okay okay fine yeah, sure. uh so okay fine and so this is a elderly female uh, she had to became with multiple joint pain ems mother had rheumatoid she had recurrent anemia repeated blood transfusion actually she was a mother of a gynecologist so the doctor kept on uh, transfusing because she had recurrent anemia so they wanted to rule out autoimmune cause we did everything everything was fine but she had a very typical inflammatory arthritis so she didn't tolerate hydroxychloroquine she had some gastritis so just kept her on a, i think 500 mg twice daily of uh, sulfa salicin with low dose steroids uh, but told them clearly that something is not fitting in uh, we actually even went ahead and did the bone marrow in view of that uh, this one recurrent anemia the first bone marrow was uh, normal uh, then the sorry then the same patient uh, uh, lost follow up uh, after some time uh, the doctor like the sunny law was also a doctor he just gave me a call then he told she again had uh, uh, bone marrow means second and third time second was also normal and third one uh, gave a diagnosis of it was actually a myelodysplastic syndrome and we actually lost her maybe the repeated blood transfusions or altered the picture or not we don't know so she was somebody with a very typical history of morning stiffness like an inflammatory arthritis uh, but it was totally something else so elderly people always remember there is something called carcinomatous polyarthritis so sometimes it might be blood dyscrasia or it might be any other solid organ tumor uh, which can present like uh, this one so sudden onset of arthritis in elderly systemic symptoms refractory to treatment do think about uh, carcinomatous polyarthritis so next we'll be going into investigation just few more slides so elderly female uh, multiple joint pain low hemoglobin high esr creatinine high rheumatoid uh, factor was strongly positive and ana was also positive because of which she got referred to me Uh, so again anybody who wants to take a guess any elderly female with anemia and uh, raised esr and uh, high creat we always think that is nothing but a multiple myeloma so here a strong rheumatoid factor positive doesn't means anything nor a ana which is positive so always as i told just a immunological investigation positive doesn't means anything so whenever you see a immunological test test positive please don't get excited look into the clinical picture see whether the clinical picture really contributes to the uh, whatever the blood we ask for like if it's an ana whether the patient has a uh, ctd feature or if it is a rheumatoid whether it's a really rheumatoid so rheumatoid factor is basically nothing but an auto antibody which is directed against the fc portion of an uh, immunoglobulin like igg so it is basically an auto antibody so rheumatoid factor positive doesn't means only rheumatoid arthritis that is the reason we don't call it ra factor we call it as a rheumatoid factor you can see a differential diagnosis are there 
so in rheumatoid uh, factor is positive do think of the other things also uh, and others most important than that will be this because if you are going to start a patient on a immunosuppression for uh, somebody with a bacterial endocarditis or a neoplasm then it will be catastrophic had a 30 year old female with a strong more than 200 anti ccb positive rheumatoid factor positive she came with hip pain actually she had hip secondaries she had adenocarcinoma of the bowel presenting with hip secondaries and also had a, a, what is um, like a multiple secondaries in the lungs so autoantibody positive doesn't means anything so rheumatoid factor positivity is not synonymous with rheumatoid that is the take home message from this slide so other thing we always ask is anti ccp remember uh, rheumatoid factor and anti ccp the sensitivity is almost same except for early ra where the anti ccp might be a bit more sensitive of course anti ccp is more specific in indian situation uh, asking for one is enough or one is positive no it's not always a must or you have to wait to start treatment you can always ask the other one later as we know anti ccp is a little bit costly the other one is esr crp we always ask in inflammatory arthritis as i told usually they are uh, supposed to be elevated but can be normal also so just remember this and uh, any please ask only if there are any history of connective tissue disorder any of these things or any subtle signs as i told uh, uh, any subtle signs should be there otherwise please uh, don't think of uh, don't ask for any because we see lot of false positives people google it they think they have sle or something else then it becomes very difficult to convince that it's a false positive so then this is another most abused test ask for it only if you think in terms of a rheumatic fever or a post streptococcal reactive arthritis otherwise again aso you get lot of false positives because a simple colonization also can cause a false positive aso so take home messages uh, any polyarthritis first decide whether it's inflammatory or mechanical always remember serological investigation is relevant only in the appropriate clinical background without the clinical picture there is no meaning for a serological investigation higher the pre test probability the more relevant will be the test result so here usually we are not in uh, more about labeling the disease we are more uh, uh, bothered about treating the system involved so whether it is a undifferentiated connective tissue disorder with ana positive with the polyarthritis or rheumatoid or sle with arthritis we have to treat the arthritis many times we rheumatologists sit and wait for the disease to evolve so labeling if possible is okay otherwise we always wait for it uh, so you have to tell the patient that many times these disease evolve over a period of time so for investigation always ask only if it's necessary most of these investigations are pretty costly and always remember the chances of false positive and also false negative rate before asking for any immunological test always follow up diseases evolve a itp patient today can be sle patient tomorrow a mctd patient today can be sle patient tomorrow or a uctd patient can be can change to some other connective tissue disorder tomorrow like undifferentiated one so always wait for the disease to evolve many times we get up after have arthritis then later they even can see patients developing vasculitis thank you thank you so much dr sham before we move on to the next speaker i'll just uh, like to apprise the participants that you can type in your questions in the chat box the participants can please uh, type in their questions in the chat box we will be taking in the questions for all three talks at the end we have a slot for question and answer please also write whether your question is related to the top uh, that you can write the particular topic polyarthritis monoarthritis or low back pain or you can even write the name of the speaker so that we can find out who you want your question to be addressed to uh, please you can write, ask your questions in the chat box with that i would like to bring on the next speaker dr rajkiran please shall i start uh, sharing uh, mohit yes yes please are my slides visible mohit no not yet sir you you can see yes now now it's opening just yes full screen yeah is it clear now yes it's absolutely clear yes good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, i thank you uh, dr mohit uh, and uh, physicians uh, from udaipur and across the country who had joined this wonderful program and interaction between rheumatologists and physicians 
and i also thank uh, other members of organizing committee dr vinod ravindran sir dimlesh manshu uh, and rest of the team most of the things have already been uh, covered by sham so i'll just touch upon a few things which dr mohit had asked me to talk on one is he asked me specifically to focus on gout then tuberculosis arthritis and on synovial fluid analysis but since the title is about an approach to monoarthritis i'll just make a few points first thing is whenever someone come across uh, this problem of a joint pain involving a particular joint first thing is we need to see where exactly the pain or the site of inflammation is there is it from uh, the articular structure or a periarticular structure we need to have a rough idea about the anatomy of the joint just a minute so we need to have a rough idea about the anatomy of this joint we should know what are the structures which are there in the joint the synovium the synovial fluid the cartilage uh, and these constitute the articular uh, structure and uh, in arthritis these are the structures which can be involved and it can be the periarticular structures like bursitis ligaments tendons which can get damaged they also can cause pain i really don't know how come this has come here uh, but anyway we'll go forward so what are the diseases which can present as an acute monoarticular arthritis when i am talking about acute monoarticular arthritis it's about an arthritis which is there of less than 6 weeks duration so in an acute arthritis we need to think of infection we need to think of uh, like crystal diseases like gout and pseudogout we need to think of trauma but sometimes there can be a rarely a juvenile arthritis or an osteoarthritis which can flare up and present as an acute arthritis so chronic monoarticular arthritis is an arthritis involving a single joint with a duration of more than 6 weeks most commonly in our country we think of tuberculosis rarely fungal and western world talks about lyme's arthritis and sometimes there can be a variant of uh, a monoarticular presentation of rheumatoid arthritis for example i have come across a patient uh, who had only knee joint pain and swelling so we did all the work up to rule out tuberculosis cppd and other conditions like spa and his uh, rheumatoid factor and anti ccp uh, were quite high but this doesn't qualify him uh, as per criteria to be called as rheumatoid arthritis then orthopedician had uh, went forward and uh, we did a synovial analysis which was inflammatory and orthopedician did a biopsy which had shown non specific inflammatory synovitis and we started treating him with uh, dmrts because it is an inflammatory joint there is a high risk of destruction of the joint and over a period of time after 6 months uh, down the lane this person has developed pain in his mcp joints and pap joints so this kind of presentation will make us understand that sometimes rarely in some patients it uh, rheumatoid arthritis can present uh, in a monoarticular way and we commonly come across patients with seronegative spondyl arthropathy like hlb27 peripheral arthritis or reactive arthritis or psoriatic arthritis they can just present with an ankle arthritis or a knee arthritis and sarcoidosis can also present with the lower extremity arthritis especially we find erythema nodosum and an ankle arthritis kind of picture sometimes there can be non inflammatory pain involving a single joint like knee osteoarthritis avascular necrosis and young man coming with uh, or a, or a female or somebody who was on steroids back uh, taking for some other reason for an eye problem or lung problem who might come uh, present to us with hip pain Uh, acute pain or a chronic pain this categorically fits into a monoarticular arthritis and when we evaluate there might not be inflammation at all there might be a vascular necrosis so as sham already mentioned whenever we come across whenever we come across this entity of arthritis we need to see whether it is an inflammatory arthritis or non inflammatory arthritis because we have to be very clear that we should not unnecessarily medicate our patients if we are dealing with a non inflammatory arthritis sham has already said that sometimes we can come across a cases of hypermobile joint syndrome hydroarthrosis where absolutely there is no inflammation at all and we should not unnecessarily give them dmrts or steroids or any kind of an anti inflammatory therapies so the simple thing the rule of thumb is to differentiate how to differentiate between an inflammatory joint and a non inflammatory joint see if your patient tells if he, his symptoms get worsened with rest think of inflammatory arthritis if his symptoms get relieved with rest and gets worsened with movements it can be a non inflammatory arthritis 
So this is this is one important aspect. And most important thing as a rheumatologist, which we commonly ask our patients is stiffness after rest. And the prolonged period of rest is overnight. So we call them, we ask them about, do they have any early morning stiffness? So this becomes the most important thing. The presence of an early morning stiffness in the joint of more than 30 to 60 minutes, we need to consider seriously an inflammatory disease. So there are also other signs and symptoms of inflammatory arthritis, like swelling, erythema, warmth, and systemic symptoms, elevation of acute phase markers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as I said, there can be certain polyarticular diseases. So in future, they can uh, have uh, a polyarticular disease, and these uh, patients can present uh, initially deceivingly a monoarticular presentation. So as I said, same rheumatoid, reactive, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Sometimes. We come across children of uh, seven-year-old or eight-year-old, nine-year-old coming with a knee joint pain or ankle joint pain. So the initial presentation sometimes in children, especially, can be a single joint involvement. So we, whenever, but as a rule, when somebody presents with a single joint involvement, we have been taught and we teach, and in our experience also, the first and foremost thing, if it is a monoarthritis, always try to rule out infection, 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 and also take the history of trauma. And if this is rolled out, just see that does this patient fit into any, uh, a poly, I mean, uh, this patient will develop any future polyarthritis. So like uh, another thing is, another thing in the history is what is the time of onset? Suppose if someone's pain comes from seconds to minutes, then uh, it can be a trauma. So a football player. Uh, uh, running and just attempting to play and suddenly if he develops knee pain and swelling and he comes to us, it happens all of a sudden. It can be an internal knee derangement involving some tear of ligament. Suppose if someone develops a pain overnight, this man had developed pain in the middle of the night and early morning he is unable to walk. His great toe is swollen. He has a podagra kind of thing and in next 8 to 10 hours, things have become very worst and he is unable to perform any activity. He is not able to work. And he might come to our clinic on wheelchair. If such kind of presentation is there, think of gout or any crystal disease. Suppose if the patient is having a pain in the knees, a swelling, which is gradually over two weeks, three weeks, building up, it can be a chronic infective monoarthritis or it can be an initial presentation of any chronic inflammatory polyarthritis. So if uh, not in India, but still in, uh, in cosmopolitan India, we can sometimes get a history of IV drug abuse once in a while in Hyderabad. We see some patients, they, they deny, but when we check their forearms, we get the needle pricks. We see patients who are having an IV drug abuse. We need to roll out HIV, reactive arthritis, and other kinds of uh, diseases where it, it can uh, disseminate, the infection can disseminate to the joint and call, uh, cause arthritis. And uh, like patients with gout, uh, they typically tell one year before they had a pain in the MTP joint or an ankle joint. And with painkillers and treatments, it has subsided. And again, after one year, now doctors are getting this pain again after one year. So this pain is again repeated after one year. So if this kind of history is given, you always should keep a crystal arthritis like gout or CPPD in your mind. As Sham uh, very well said, if any person uh, presents to you with a monoarthritis or a polyarthritis, as, as we were discussing before starting of this program, rheumatology is an extension of internal medicine and uh, like we need to do a complete uh, systemic examination. So if someone presents with a monoarthritis or a polyarthritis, look for a psoriatic kind of rash, ask for the history of back pain. This person might be, the person who comes to us with a knee pain and swelling might have a sacroiliac joint pain, which might be misled as a discogenic pain and which might be treated with gabapentin pregolbulin for a long time. So carefully we need to look whether that person is having a sacroiliac and a knee arthritis or an ankle arthritis. History of diarrhea or UTI just before development of arthritis, we can point towards a reactive arthritis kind of condition. And we can sometimes get a patient with uveitis or a red eye and uh, sometimes uh, with knee joint pain or ankle joint pain, lower extremity, single joint arthritis. So all these things will give us a clue like what could be the underlying disease. Once you identify underlying disease, you can prognosticate the patients. The treatment becomes quite easy. And in children, sometimes we come across hemarthrosis. Child might have a bleeding problems, bleeding diathesis. Any set of trauma to the knee joint or ankle joint can develop a fusion there and it might cause an arthritis. And as I earlier said, someone taking long-term steroids for the lung problem or an eye problem or some other, other neurological problem 
and they if they come with knee pain especially night pain severe pain in the leg unable to walk and remember sometimes this avascular necrosis of hip can also present as a referral pain and the patient might tell the pain is there actually in the knee and we try to look uh, we try to evaluate completely knee x-rays knee everything we try to examine knee looks might be normal and whenever somebody complains of knee pain if you feel knee is absolutely normal also we need to check their hip movements and we need to say is there any something wrong in the hip and is this a kind of a referred pain so as i said when you see this kind of a joint so assume that this joint is infected until unless proven a red hot swollen joint think as an infection so it can be gout it can be something else it can be an acute flare of an any polyarthritis but infection should be the one which has to be ruled out because infection has to be ruled out because infection is a one thing which can quickly destroy the joint and infection is one thing which can disseminate it disseminate from the joint to elsewhere and it can create lots of problems and we have certain serological markers like elevated parameters like esr crp they can tell us that it could be an infection but having said that even those things can get elevated and gout so as uh, mohit asked me like how to pick up gout so we have two settings in gout one is acute gout and the other one is chronic chronic gout coming to the theme of this uh, the clinical pulse remember gout is always an abrupt onset pain abrupt onset disease you have an acute gout patient comes with an history of abrupt onset usually the pain starts with something like a needle pricking in the joint that's what the patient tells and over a period of time within 8 to 12 hours the pain increases in such a level uh, like the typical explanation is the scorpion bite uh, severity pain we can see in the gout patients and most often the first attack or the very bad attack patient comes uh, in a wheelchair and there can be seepage and swelling of the uh, uh, like uh, entire feet so it often starts in the night and early morning first mpb joint is the most common joint which which affects and gout uh, could be because of the crystal formation temperature changes and repeated trauma so multiple uh, like hypotheses are told about that so then later on over a period of time this patients might get attacks again and again if they are not on proper ureth lowering therapy or if they have a chronic kidney disease or if they are not uh, properly uh, like uh, managing their diet habits or if they have an hematological malignancy so there can be background multiple problems which can lead this patient to have a chronic disease once they have a chronic disease the uric acid gets deposited deposited and becomes a chalky paste kind of thing and this we we see as a tophi most often sometimes we mistake and uh, we mistake tophi as a pus kind of thing but actually it's it's uh, it's a tophaceous chalky white material coming from the joint from the joint so this uh, in a chronic gout patients can also develop uh, crystals and the joint gets destroyed completely so what triggers gout if anybody coming with you to an acute onset pain no history of trauma no history of significant fever or no localization of infection anywhere and if the person gives you a history of a binge alcohol drinking if the family history of gout is there and if uh, the patient is on certain medications like diuretics aspirin etc and if the patient is on a chemotherapy fructose injection and especially post uh, surgery bypass cabg so these patients if they develop pain keep gout in your mind and the gold standard even today is the demonstration of crystals it's quite easy to demonstrate crystals in our center we do this so whenever we have a dilemma of gout sometimes what happens is in acute gout the uric acid levels may be deceptively normal or low so this can happen because of inflammation il6 causing more of uric acid excretion so a lot of factors involved here the uric acid levels may be normal or slightly low in such condition generally what we do is we tap the fluid or we take out the tophaceous medical simply make a slide put a cover slip look it under microscope immediately you will notice a very beautiful uh, like needle shaped crystals which are suggestive of gout and the synovial fluid count is usually inflammatory and gram stains are negative in chronic gout you have an entirely destroyed joint there was a uh, like now in our center we do a lot of ultrasounds uh, to identify gout in early gout if the joint is not destroyed we can make a double contour sound double contour sign i'll show you what is it in the next slide and and one of the very fascinating and interesting investigation is dual energy ct this is an image of dual energy ct where you can see this gout crystals as this in a greenish color so this is this is very passionate investigation if you have a good radiologist who can do uh, in in a lesser cost if you have a dilemma 
uh, in uh, in a gout you can you can demonstrate uh, gout in this way in a dual energy ct scan so uh, it's it's easy to to label gout when we have a first mtp joint pain or a, on, on a feet pain but sometimes especially in atypical presentations can happen in patients with ckd or a chronic gout the flare actually may be uh, in an uh, like mc mcp joint like here this patient had this kind of pain and swelling so we think of chronic infection uh, tuberculosis lot of things which come into differential diagnosis but a simple investigation like a draw synovial fluid put it under microscope you will find this needle shaped crystals and when you do an ultrasound you find this double contour sign where the crystals get deposited along the margins of cartilage and uh, which appears uh, very very much brighter so like just one word about pseudo gout it is mostly seen in osteoarthritic joints where you find the cppd crystals which get deposited in the within the cartilage and the inside inflammation uh, the episodes of inflammation come on and off so when you see this kind of uh, like uh, like calcification of uh, cartilage you think of cppd so coming to next to tuberculosis the most common site of tuberculosis is spine the pot spine is the most common uh, osteoarticular tuberculosis what we see after spine the hip and knee share uh, the next uh, burden of uh, of uh, uh, the bone tv and most often the signs of uh, bone tuberculosis are uh, it can present like a chronic mono arthritis the hip joint or knee joint uh, like pain and inflammation can be there so whenever uh, whenever anybody comes uh, with a chronic uh, mono arthritis of hip so the basic thing we do x ray and we need to see any reduction of joint space and we also do a, we need to do a survey like uh, like what dr sham was telling we need to see is there any history of involvement of uh, joints anywhere else and the uh, nobody nobody else uh, apart from physician can do uh, a global survey of the body like uh, to look for the chest to look for the lymph nodes in the neck uh, or axilla or the groin so uh, to to find out any skin problems to, to we need to look for any uh, clues anywhere else sometimes this uh, this patient uh, where who had an hip arthritis had a, a big uh, lymph nodes in the neck so when we did a lymph node biopsy it was showing a uh, case chest necrosis and was treated for tuberculosis apart from that montox test tb gold and other investigations whole body pet ct scan which can also help us to identify these problems and mri also is very helpful i am not touching upon mri sacroiliacus so i just am talking about mri hip and knee mri sometimes is very helpful in these conditions because mri in tuberculosis or any infection it doesn't respect the joint and there will be a lot of soft tissue inflammation and tuber this patient have a tuberculosis knee this patient presented with a knee pain and swelling and this patient uh, had a very severe pain and the most important thing is in a chronic mono arthritis like tuberculosis this patients have a significant wasting of thigh so when you see a knee joint a chronic mono arthritis when you find when you find a significant thigh muscle wasting think tuberculosis or think a chronic infective mono arthritis in your mind so this patient when we did a chest x ray chest x ray was showing a mottled lung so he had a miliary tb and then after treating but but uh, he had a symptoms of more than one month and uh, tuberculosis tuberculosis of any joint if not treated it will very quickly destroy the joint unlike tuber unlike mono arthritis or spa or jra or rheumatoid arthritis tuberculosis or infective arthritis of uh, of any single joint will just damage the joint like anything within a short period within months time the joint will get destroyed so we need to protect the joint by giving proper therapies and proper splints so that joint doesn't get uh, further and we have other things like uh, classical teachings of fermister's triad where you have an osteopenia periotic and peripheral erosions and joint space reduction all those things so but now with modern investigations looking at clinically x ray mri synovial fluid biopsy we can conclude the diagnosis and coming to last part of my talk that is synovial fluid so whenever uh, whenever uh, any any fluid uh, like as i said when you suspect a tuberculous mono arthritis uh, extract the fluid anyway that we ask for a gram stain and afb the yield for afb is quite low uh, sometimes we send for uh, tuberculosis culture it might take some time and very high counts with predominant lymphocytes can be uh, can point us towards uh, like uh, gb and if you have any doubt we can get a synovial fluid biopsy so whenever we uh, remove synovial fluid when we have a doubt suppose a knee joint is there ankle or a mcp joint or an elbow joint or a shoulder joint a single joint is involved as a rheumatologist we can we'll just put a needle and we try to take off the fluid 
Sometimes we take the help of ultrasound. Nowadays, we have an ultrasound. most of us we have equipped with an ultrasound. We try to locate if the fluid is deep seated. We try to do an ultrasound. We mark it and we take out the fluid. First, look at the color of the fluid. Normal, normal synovial fluid is pale yellow. If it is red, you just see. Sometimes initially it will be blood tinged if you hit some blood vessel. But completely through and through blood, you need to think of hemorrhosis. Look at the coagulation parameters of this patient. And uh, usually inflammatory uh, arthritis will be slightly turbid. And you have a chylus effusion sometimes, completely white. And if you have a purulent effusion uh, in a septic arthritis kind of uh, condition. And we ask for synovial fluid TCDC. If the counts are less than 200, it's normal. And if it is more than 1,000, it can be inflammatory. If it is more than 50,000, think of septic. So this is uh, a simple diag a simple chart which tells us how to interpret the synovial fluid. Less than 200, think it's normal. And always, uh, when you look at the synovial fluid cell count, also ask for differential count. So this will give you a clue. Like ask about the polymorphonuclear cells and ask about the lymphocytes. 200 to 2000, it can be still non-inflammatory sometimes, but more than 2000, definitely yes. Think of inflammatory arthritis, more than 50,000. Keep uh, pyoarthritis, uh, pyoarthritis in your mind. And uh, this uh, is an approach. Like if you have uh, like a cell count uh, with more than 1000 and less than 30,000, just you see uh, for a gram stain culture, if anything has come out, and you mainly focus on polymorphonuclear. Some pathologists also look for ragocytes. I'll tell you what are ragocytes. If you have more than 90% polymorphs, think of infective arthritis. If you have up to mixed polymorphs and lymphos and you have, a, you have up to 70%, think of rheumatoid arthritis. There are, there are other cells, I'll tell you, cytophagocytic monocytes, which are very characteristically seen in seronegative spondyl arthropathies. We can take, we can ask, if you have a doubt that it is, a, it is an SPA, you ask your pathologist to look for specifically these cells. I'll tell you what are these. And if you have predominant lymphocytes, like more than 70%, it can happen in lupus, it can happen in, in tuberculosis. And if you have predominantly monocytes, think of viral, poly, viral arthritis. So just uh, to make it simple, polymorphs, infective, and uh, like if you have polymorphs and lymphos, think of rheumatoid, predominantly lymphos, SLE and TB, and predominantly monocytes, think of viral I think there's uh, there seems to be uh, a connectivity issue with uh, Dr. Rajkiran. Uh, we'll just wait for a minute and see if he can join us back. Or oh, Dr. Dr. Himanshu, can we move on to your talk? Because there seems to be some problem, and maybe. Uh, if he wants to give a, his close-up comments, Dr. Rajkiran, he can do with uh, that with the question and answer session. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Himanshu, please, with your talk. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I will be talking on uh, low back pain. So Mohit uh, told me to cover this point, points. Uh, what are the common and common causes? Mohit, am I visible? Uh, 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 can you hear me? Uh, Mohit, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. OK. Yes. So uh, what are the common and uncommon causes? Uh, then uh, importantly, uh, the, the focus of this talk, uh, how not to miss uh, ankylosing spondylitis and what are the imaging modalities? So as we've been discussing since uh, start of this uh, talk, uh, so this is one of the projects done by ICMR in 2012. And they did a survey in normal population. They went to home to home uh, for the common musculoskeletal problems. 
So if you see this, about 30 to 40% of the patient, uh, normal population had back pain at a given point of time. And we all experience that uh, low back pain is a very common presenting complaint. So when we think of back, so when we think from where this pain is coming, so if you think of the anatomy, we have uh, in spine, we have vertebra, we have disc, then we have spinous processes, then uh, uh, paralumbar muscles, uh, uh, muscular musculature involvement, and then uh, hip, hip joints and sacroiliac joints. So when we think of back, we have to think of all these causes, back pain, we have to think of all these causes. And then we, as we already know that it is definitely a challenge of differentiation. And most of the time uh, on a routine uh, visit, it's very difficult to make, is it a mechanical pain or it is an inflammatory pain? So what are the causes of inflammatory and mechanical causes? So when we say inflammatory back pain, the pain is essentially is coming from sacroiliac joint. And what is the common cause of mechanical back pain? So mechanical back pain, commonly it comes from degenerated disc, facet joints, maybe a fracture, muscle imbalance, osteoarthritis, kyphosis, scoliosis, stenosis. So all these reasons could be a cause of mechanical back. On the contrary, inflammatory back. So when we say inflammatory back, the reason could be ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease related sacroiliitis, psoriatic spondylitis, reactive arthritis sometimes cause uh, uh, inflammatory back. And then other causes. I think those causes are more important for our internist, but we should be knowing about it. Like back pain coming from abdominal aortic aneurysm, back pain from uh, pelvic issues, fibromyalgia, uh, coming from gastrointestinal issues. So what are the red flags? So essentially, when we see a patient of back pain, low back pain, these are the points which we should not be missing. So if back pain is coming from abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm, it would be, history would be sudden onset, continuous back pain. Patient may be a history of cardiovascular disease. And on examination, you may find a abdominal mass, pulsating abdominal mass. If it is a tumor, usually the patient age is more than 50 years. There may be a past history of cancer, pain more in nighttime. And on examination, there you may find uh, solid lymph nodes, neurological deficit, unexplained weight loss. If it is coming from kidneys, uh, there may be history of UTI, there may be history of kidney stones. And on examination, you will have tenderness uh, on renal angle. The patient may, may be giving a history of fever, chills. Uh, if it is a peptic ulcer, so there may be a history of gastritis and you may find epigastric tenderness. And if there is a history of infection, then the patient will be generally unwell. There will be a history of chills and rigors, uh, recent history of UTI, patient on immunosuppressive drugs, diabetes, weight loss, and on examination, patient may have fever, back tenderness, neurological deficit. So all these things, so all these things are red flags. And I'm discussing this upfront because these things are not to be missed. So if there is any red flag you find on low back pain examination, you need to uh, investigate it and probably refer it to the concerned speciality. So when we say back pain and mechanical pain, so it is very important to differentiate uh, between back, uh, inflammatory back pain and mechanical back pain. So what is inflammatory back pain? So inflammatory back pain is any back pain coming in at the age of less than 40 years. Usually it is insidious in onset, uh, two to three uh, months. The, the back pain is associated with morning stiffness. Patient will say that the, pain, uh, the back hurts in morning and usually the stiffness is more than one hour. The pain usually improves with exercise but doesn't improve with rest. And sometimes patient may have back pain in the night time and later of the night, and the patient may complain of uh, pelvic pain, sacroiliac pain. On the contrary, mechanical back pain, as we all know, it can happen at any age. It usually, uh, patient will wake up in the morning with back pain, but the back stiffness improves uh, in uh, less than 30 minutes. It is usually worsened with exercise. It doesn't improve with exercise, and it usually gets better with rest. And the very important point is that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which we commonly prescribe for back pain, inflammatory back pain patient will have a tremendous benefit with those uh, medication. On the contrary, mechanical back pain patient doesn't get benefit. 
so uh, given all these points uh, there is this ss classification criteria for diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis so when we say inflammatory back pain so how do we diagnose spondyloarthritis so in a patient who has got more than 3 month back pain history and whose age of onset is less than 40 year, 45 years we can diagnose that patient we can classify uh, that patient as a sacroiliitis by two criteria so one is imaging criteria where uh, we can use mri and spondyloarthritis feature and other is hlb27 and two of the spondyloarthritis feature so you may find positive findings in mri or x ray and spondyloarthritis feature so what are the spondyloarthritis feature so the important is inflammatory back pain arthritis inflammatory arthritis as we have discussed in last two talks enthesitis uh, achilles tendonitis history of uveitis history of psoriasis history of cones disease very good response to non steroidals family history of spondyloarthritis hlb27 positivity and rare crp so all these are spondyloarthritis feature so when you are seeing a patient young patient who has got back pain more than 3 months all these features we need to examine and if on symptoms there is inflammatory back history of arthritis uveitis and when we do imaging there is a sacroiliitis on x ray or mri on blood lab test raise the esr crp and there is a history of non steroidal responsiveness you can confirm uh, very comfortably diagnose that patient has uh, axial spondyloarthritis so from now on i will be showing you some pictures so this is a patient uh, chronic back pain and you see the patient that the patient has now developed a co contractures of his hips and knees so this patient is uh, ankylosing spondylitis similarly you see that in this patient there is a, a disappearance of lordosis of lumbar spine and on so there they lose their flexibility of the back there is al uh, almost flat back and this is a we see we come still at this age we come across this patients who have got severe kyphosis of their thoracic uh, thoracic and cervical spine so all this patient have history of inflammatory back pain so given all this scenario when we do so coming to the imaging when we should be doing x rays and mris so on x rays actually we can diagnose sacroiliitis and so this is a new york uh, classic visible sacroiliac joint but on this x ray this patient on the right side had mild sclerosis on the right side on the left side there's got bilateral sclerosis now this x ray this is a grade 3 and you can visibly appreciate that the sclerosis uh, on bilateral has definitely increased in the previous x rays and this is a grade 4 which is complete fusion so this is how it was all diagnosed uh, previously this ankylosing spondylitis but this is to be taken that all these radiological changes needs years to uh, to come so uh, on a, on a, if if you are investigating a patient who has got back pain for 1 to 2 years you may not find any radiological changes and this is another x ray so all this x ray findings so this is on the ap view of lumbar spine you can see a tram track sign on the x ray you can see a dagger sign of the spinal process so you may all have come across all this uh, x ray findings uh, of the lumbar spine on x ray and when you see this type of findings this is ankylosing spondylitis on the lumbar spine x ray what you may find so this is a young patient 37 year old male patient uh, on the lumbar spine x ray you may find uh, squaring of the vertebral uh, vertebra uh, squaring of the vertebra syndesmophytes and shiny corners and unless you tell a radiologist or unless you look for all these findings you may miss these changes and in the subsequent years uh, you may find that syndesmophytes are now um, enlarging and there happens a complete fusion of this syndesmophyte which is known as bamboo spine there may sometime you may find facet joint abnorm abnormality with bamboo spine and radiologically you can in fact uh, differentiate what is uh, ankylosing spondylitis and what is degenerative or osteoarthritis so the syndesmophytes of ankylosing spondylitis they travel horizontally and they that's how the fusion happens in the subsequent vertebra on the contrary the spondylophytes the osteoarthritis and the uh, spondylophytes they travel horizontally 
So you look at the X-ray and you can say that, okay, so this is ankylosing spondylitis and this is osteoarthritis. So the trouble is the reassurance from normal X-ray. So this is a 31 year old male patient who, who had all the typical findings of inflammatory back pain uh, uh, as, per our uh, as per the slides discussion a few slides back. But because the clinical suspicion was high, you went ahead and did an MRI and on MRI, you find sacroiliitis. So, so as I was saying, so this is a trouble with normal X-rays. So when you got very high clinical suspicion of inflammatory back, the advice is to straight away go for MRI. So when to do MRI? In fact, now, if you're pretty sure, you can straight away go for MRI, but we know that MRI is expensive, but it has got low radiation risk. And if you have, uh, on a back pain patient, you have high clinical suspicion of red flags, say malignancy infection, you should ideally go straight for MRI. So what is the positive definition of MRI? So on MRI, there should be sacroiliitis and there should be bone marrow edema. So that's how we diagnose. So nowadays, unless what we do is we have a very good relationship with a radiologist and we, we tell the radiologist that we want to look for inflammatory, if we want to look for sacroiliitis and then they they do a proper imaging and then we come to the diagnosis. So this is a T1 uh, of MRI where uh, you see uh, this uh, 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 hyperlucent shadow there and the, on the star, you can see that on the left side, the, uh, it is active sacroiliitis. Unless you ask for it from the radiologist, sometimes radiologists, they also miss and they just report it as a degenerative uh, MRI. Similar to, similarly to the uh, sacroiliac joint, you may find you may find the findings on the vertebras, the lumbar vertebra. On the X-ray, as you said that, uh, as we discussed, shiny corners. On MRI, you find all these shiny corner hyperlucent shadows. There, so this is MRI of plantar fasciitis. Uh, you can see the inflammation of the plantar fascia. So if you if you got a plantar fasciitis, you got a Achilles tendonitis and back pain, you know that this is a spondyloarthritis case. So before ordering an MRI, always look for clinical symptoms and always mention to the radiologist that what you want to see. You want to look for those shiny corners on the vertebra. You want to look for inflammatory uh, shadows on the sacroiliac joint. CT scan. CT scan may be helpful, but uh, CT scan, uh, we, can, uh, we can only diagnose, uh, say, vertebral fracture on that. Uh, uh, that's about it. So we usually, we don't do CT scan to check for inflammatory back pain. But as we have discussed, if there is a pot spine, if there is a previous history of fracture, all those findings, bony findings are visible only on CT scan. So in some scenarios, CT scan can be, uh, may be helpful. So these are some differential diagnosis. So not all back pain are ankylosing spondylitis or mechanical back pain. So this is a 32 year old lady who came to you with a history of non-specific back pain and you order a sacroiliac uh, X-ray of that and you only find hyperlucent shadows only on the pelvic side, uh, uh, only on the iliac side, and there is nothing on the pelvic side. So this is osteitis condensed and eli. So this is not a sacroiliitis. So this, all these things you need to be mindful of. Similarly, there is another differential of uh, uh, the syndesmophytes on axis, which is known, known as DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperosteosis. So usually these patients have got very significant back pain. Their back is very rigid. And on X-ray, you, you may find this typical uh, syndesmophyte similarly looking as a, uh, as an inflammatory back or ankylosing spondylitis. But these patients are usually obese. They have got to metabolic problems like the diabetes. And when you do their sacroiliac X-rays, you may find normal sacroiliac joint. So then you know that this is dish, not sacroiliac. So these are the few differentials which you need to be mindful of. And when we think of inflammatory back, we, when we think of lower back pain, ankylosing spondylitis, there is a whole spectrum of this condition. Uh, undifferentiated psoriatic arthritis, uveitis, reactive arthritis, arthritis associated with Crohn's disease. So when you make a diagnosis of inflammatory back, ankylosing spondylitis, you should always be inquiring of all these uh, scenarios. So inflammatory back pain patient, a back pain patient comes to you and he gives a history of uh, swelling in the knees. Straight away, you should be thinking of peripheral spondyl arthritis. You, when you, 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 you're sure that this is inflammatory back, you ask them about their eye issue. About 40% patient of axial spondyl arthritis patient have got history of anterior uveitis. So 
about 20 to 30 patient patients have got history of psoriasis. When you diagnose this, if you you if you history of psoriasis, you know that this is ankylosing spondylitis or spondylarthritis spectrum disease. Psoriatic arthritis, you see that this is ductilitis. And sometimes, as Dr. Sham showed that uh, umlicus, sometimes these changes are only in the feet. So unless you ask them to take out their shoes, you may, you may miss this ductilitis. So always examine their foot also. This is typical psoriatic arthritis, ductilitis, swelling of the finger. Unless you look for it, you may, may miss this ductilitis. So these all are examination findings. Patient may, may will not come out to, with these points. Achilles tendonitis. Now, sometimes you have to you have to look for it. So when you have a back pain and you ask, do they have any heel pain? And you go down and look for a swelling around the heel, and then you say that then you think that this is the Achilles tendonitis. So these are all real life patients. This patient may be linked to uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So a back pain patient comes to you, and the patient uh, have got constipation symptoms, low grade fever, recurrent diarrhea, blood in stool you may have a suspicion of Crohn's disease or IBD. Pyderma gangrenosum. So this is one of the skin condition, non-healing ulcer, which is associated with spondylarthritis spectrum. Keratoderma blenorejicum. So this is usually seen uh, with reactive arthritis. So the typical patient of this is that a uh, young patient who has got a history of uh, of UTI uh, or gastroenteritis, and two or three weeks later, he comes to you with uh, uh, with a history of uh, lower limb, uh, knee, and he uh, heel pain, and you examine their uh, 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 their palms and their toes, and you find this skin rash, and straight away you know that this is keratoderma blenorejicum, because all this is linked to that back pain, which is spondylarthritis nature. Erythema nodosum. So these are uh, shiny. Uh, uh, Swollen papules on the on the skin. We are very which are very tender on touch. So this is also a spondylarthritis which is linked to the back. And why we are discussing this? Why we want to know that what is the reason for back? Why it is inflammatory back and why it is mechanical back? Because this is a study done in uh, UK and we we known that that in India also that ankylosing spondylitis patient actually are diagnosed about nine years later from the start of their at their start of their symptoms. So if we diagnose this inflammatory back patient early and we give them treatment, we can stop the damage. So that is the whole point of diagnosis the patient early. So in summary, back pain is a very common problem in primary care consultation. Very important to distinguish between mechanical back and inflammatory back. Red flags should be investigated immediately and appropriate imaging like x-rays and MRI and CT should be ordered. Thank you. So yeah, and this is my last slide. Slide. When to refer? So and who to refer? So mechanical back, you should refer it to a physiotherapist and subsequent and subspeciality as per the clinical symptoms. But if it is an inflammatory back pain, you should refer the patient to rheumatologist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Himanshu. Uh, as Dr. Rajkiran had lost the connection, uh, I'd just like to request him if he had if he has a, a quick closing comment for his talk on monoarthritis. Uh, he couldn't close. Uh, so if you have a quick uh, one minute comment, uh, a closing comment, Dr. Rajkiran, you can have that comment here. I think he still seems to have some connection issues. So before we move on to the next session, I'll just uh, take up the two quick questions that we have received in, uh, for our speakers. Uh, first question is to you, uh, Dr. Sham. Uh, there is a question where uh, uh, Dr. Deepak said he has asked that, uh, as you said, they do not go behind the exact diagnosis, but, but just treat the disease. And he says that, does that mean steroids? So, but what about involvement of other organs, if any, like auditory or ocular symptoms? Is it not important to reach the diagnosis? So just I'll add to this, Dr. Sham. Uh, see, the, uh, what he's saying, as I understand, is different from what you said. So uh, I'll give, uh, just to add an example here, uh, there is a patient, a young female, who had a typical polyarthritis. She had a positive rheumatoid factor, raised inflammatory markers, clinically synovitis. Uh, looked some, uh, uh, near about symmetrical. She had a uh, negative NTCCP test. And uh, 
there was no involvement of other organs clinically as well as uh, imaging and laboratory wise so she was uh, treated like a uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, an year on uh, later on she developed a macular rash erythematous macular rash on his legs which was a vasculitic rash and the diagnosis then evolved and eventually she was diagnosed as uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis with on the basis of involvement of other organs which had happened later on so was she being treated with methotrexate uh, initial low dose steroid and hydroxychloroquine like rheumatoid arthritis earlier on when she didn't have absolutely any other organ involvement one is this question and one is doctor what doctor said he has asked that uh, wouldn't you give importance to auditory and ocular symptoms and is it all about steroids doctor sham please yeah exactly mohit uh, sorry if the meaning whatever i the statement has been conveyed wrongly so like what Mo- mohit told so if somebody presents with an arthritis has a rheumatoid factor positive or even an ana is also positive uh, my statement was you need not wait for us to get a ana profile done because if it is a patient with a sle or ctd with arthritis or rheumatoid we are going to start on not just steroids steroids with methotrexate definitely we will look for other organ involvement because any pain not missing an uh, ild so definitely we'll try to find out or fit into a diagnosis but even if it is not possible let us not wait for arthritis isolated cutaneous arthritis or renal involvement or a lung involvement like a major organ involvement other thing is regarding the steroids steroids is just a initial treatment always we add a steroid sparing agent or a dematch and we try to uh, taper and stop steroids even in patients with sle or vasculitis we are now going towards trying to taper and stop steroids so definitely rheumatoid we always will be stopping it maximum by 3 to 6 months so steroids is only a initial treatment definitely we have to look into all the other organ involvement so i just uh, second what mohit told regarding uh this question so the answer is we just wait for the disease to evolve and uh, on the system which is involved so we have to look into all the systems it doesn't means we don't look into other systems yes and as as uh, rightly dr sham said dr sethi we wouldn't obviously ignoring the ocular symptoms and the other symptoms if there are symptoms then we need to find out why those symptoms are there and uh, treat accordingly not just with steroids uh, there was another question uh, which i think pertains more to uh, dr himanshu's presentation so dr himanshu i would like you to take that question uh, where the gentleman uh, dr madhukar uh, is saying that a patient uh, had a uh, bilateral hip pain and uh, rheumatoid factor nt ccp negative hla b27 was negative Uh, there were no other features and the mri showed bilateral trochanteric bursitis with minimal sacroiliitis so uh, and uh, additionally he says that the kft is deranged the renal function is deranged so dr himanshu this plus what i would like to add is ki once we have a minimal sacroiliitis on mri and as you very elucidly said in your presentation firstly differentiating acute and chronic sacro- sacroiliitis and then again what are the differentials for these sacroiliitis all sacroiliitis uh, may not be spondyloarthritis may not be ankylosing spondylitis plus what is the role of c reactive protein in here and the clinical exam uh, the history taking as well as the clinical examination dr himanshu please uh, yes mohit so uh, as i can gather that uh, the patient has got minimal sacroiliitis and trochanteric bursitis so as as i said that uh, now on mri if you got a evidence of sacroiliac so first thing it would be really nice to uh, talk to your radiologist and uh, ascertain that what is it a proper sacroiliac means w- what does that mean by minimal sacroiliac is it a sacroiliac is or not there is a no term there is no term like minimal sacroiliac is so either it is sacroiliac is or it is not sacroiliac is because in your scenario in the given scenario it is very important to know are you dealing with any sacroiliac disease because differential change completely so when you have got because trochanteric bursitis can be mechanical uh, the most common cause of trochanteric bursitis is osteoarthritis or mechanical but if you got sacroiliac is on radio uh, on mri then your differentials are very wide so when you got so sacroiliac and this patient has already got ckd so usually we sometimes we come across this type of patient who got who are taking non steroidals for long time and they land up in uh, chronic kidney disease because of their inflammatory back sacroiliac pain then straight away you know that this ckd is because of this sacroiliac and sometimes we may find that sacroiliac is not always very high 
uh, not lot of you know, very large secularities secular you see you see it may be phasing so that is point one the second point is uh, which mohit said that about esr and crp as dr sham said sometime in uh, uh, spondyl arthritis we may find normal inflammatory markers the inflammatory markers esr crp may be normal so it is a clinical diagnosis so you take a proper history you ask for inflammatory back uh, pain symptoms when was the disease onset and how it progressed what are the clinical findings what are other muscular uh, muscular ex examination musculoskeletal examination finding and then you make a diagnosis in your scenario you said that hlb27 is negative so you, hlb27 may be negative in about 20 to 30% of uh, encolagin spondylitis patients so we may we don't make a diagnosis on the basis of hlb27 so it is a clinical diagnosis which is supplemented by radiological findings and laboratory findings so that's how we approach yes thank you so much dr himanshu i would like to thank uh, dr himanshu dr sham and uh, dr rajkiran for their splendid talks uh, we now move on to the next session uh next session what you have is a panel discussion uh, centering around the uh, disease modifying antirheumatic drugs uh, as we all know uh, that disease modifying antirheumatic drugs is an altogether different topics there is a lot of uh, debate as to whether these are immunosuppressants or these are immunomodulators or you know, then there are questions pertaining to when to stop and which of the dmars are to be stopped before an elective surgery which dmards can be safely given during pregnancy and which dmards can be safely given during lactation so uh, for this uh, panel discussion i would like to introduce the faculty uh, moderating this session will be uh, dr vinod ravindran uh, he is a con consultant rheumatologist at center for rheumatology calicut uh, he is uh, an, a former editor in chief of the indian journal of rheumatology and presently the editor in chief of the royal of college of physicians of uh, edinburgh uh, on the panel for this discussion would be uh, dr rahul jain consultant uh, rheumatologist at narayana hospital jaipur he is currently also the president of the indian rheumatology association rajasthan chapter uh, uh, on the panel will be dr bimlesh dhar pande he is a consultant rheumatologist senior consultant at fortis hospitals noida uh, he has a lot of research work on uh, b cell depletion and is a, an eminent clinician so with that i hand over the proceedings uh, to dr vinod ravindran for this panel discussion good afternoon everyone um, and i would like to start by thanking uh, uh, professor bomb sir uh, professor kumawat sir uh, from the api udaipur and uh, we've been very fortunate many of us are uh, visiting udaipur for the previous editions of pulse and we are very grateful for uh, help and assistance in making this program uh, worthwhile for all of us and thanks to mohit and the nice introduction i would just want to say that my panelist dr rahul and dr vimlesh are one of the most popular and busy rheumatologist in where they work that is noeda and uh, jaipur so as mohit said uh, what we got we got a, a small session uh, for you and the objective of this session is to clarify uh, some of the myths about the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs so the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs as you know are the drugs which have the potential to alter the course of the disease so for example if rheumatoid arthritis causes destruction of the damage to the joint medication used as disease modifying agent would not let that happen or it will slow down the damage process currently there are three categories of disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs uh, first one is the conventional which you all know methotrexate leflunomide sulfasalazine hydroxychloroquine and then you got a few new entrants like igrutimod then you got another category of disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs which are called biological action agents so they are more precise targeted to the uh, exact abrasion within the immune system 
so not only they are costly uh, they are dangerous also if uh, not used appropriately and the examples are uh, etancept infliximab uh, adalumumab and then you have rituximab the third category of anti rheumatic uh, disease modifying drugs is something which has come about recently and they are called small molecules so they are inhibitors of jack pathways within the immune system and they uh, whatever is available right now they are all tablets okay so what we'll do is we'll just start the discussion by addressing a very common uh, question which we all come across is uh, what is so the drugs which are used in rheumatology practice are they actually immunomodulators or immunosuppressants okay so i will start the the discussion by asking um, dr rahul that if you could uh, just you know explain to us uh, what's the difference between immunomodulators and immunosuppressants thank you good afternoon everyone thank you vinod sir and thank you mohit and as you told us about uh, immuno this thing ki these dmars inhibits the natural course of the disease or modifies the natural course of the disease so uh, immunomodulation involves activation suppression or resetting of the immune activated immune system is called as immunomodulation and in rheumatoid uh, disease basically there is all these disease modifying drugs usually leads to immunomodulation of immune system not the immunosuppression and other immunosuppressive drugs like which usually suppresses the immune system and which usually used in oncology practice or severe rheumatological diseases like sle if suppose there is a life threatening uh, organ threatening uh, sle is there then we use immunosuppressive doses of those immunosuppressants so basic difference is uh, either it activates the immune system or resetting the immune um, uh, system uh, which is you activated because of autoimmunity or third one is suppression of immune system because of uh, th that will lead to uh, disease modification thank you so i think that is uh, clear uh, perhaps it, it is linked to the the dose also so that leads to my second question to dr rahul um one of the common uh, sort of you know the myth or confusion which comes uh, in in uh, practice is the use of the drug methotrexate yeah um when when i mean so are there any scenarios where a drug uh, such as methotrexate can be uh, immunomodulator or immunosuppressant uh, depending on what is the setting which is used what is the dose it is used yeah uh, methotrexate is just like a aspirin tablet it is in uh, aspirin in low doses is a anti thrombotic drug and high doses is a anti inflammatory drug so methotrexate in low dose is a anti inflammatory drug or it is a immunomodulatory drug which is being is being used in rheumatological practice a common rheumatological disorders like rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, like psoriasis and uh, in other uveitis also this drug is being used or ibd or uh, while in high doses it is being used in oncology settings uh, and it and it will be a real immunosuppressant in the, the, that situation but but in low doses it is a immunomodulatory and dose will be dose is reduced as well as side effects are lower as compared to high doses of methotrexate thank you rahul so i think uh, uh, the summary here is, would be that methotrexate is uh, is a, um, a key medicine in rheumatology and i think you know we had enough experience with this drug to reassure everybody our physicians uh, colleagues Uh, patients that uh, at the doses which is used in rheumatology this drug is very safe and very effective uh moving on to the next set of questions um so because of this confusion dr vimlesh because of this confusion between immunomodulator immunosuppressants many of the uh, the disease modifying drugs are discontinued uh, i mean sort of you know, what's your views on that should that be done or not done 
the answer is big no and i would like to come forward with uh, what the data says or what the science be so if you permit i'm going to share a few slides which will help to understand the context of your question in a correct perspective so going forward what we have understood is something between immunosuppressants immunomodulators and dr rahul was clear explaining it and this happened quite recently when ular came up with a quick guideline because people stopped taking drugs on the pretext of covid-19 and it is a general tendency that patients of various rheumatic diseases are quite vulnerable to uh, improper scientific information and they would uh, switch stop or take the drugs you know the way they wish and that's why the concept of uh, immunomodulators and immunosuppressants came up and they said the drugs that we are using the common drugs say even methotrexate is a immunomodulator the jack inhibitor is a immunomodulator and there are other drugs which are immunosuppressants and if you know how to use your drugs in a correct way you don't land up with a problem so moving forward so there were few issues that needs to be you know uh, looked into so the question is what happens if you stop your drugs and i'm using covid pandemic as the real time thing that has happened and we have all seen it one thing is very assuring that if you stop your drug your disease is going to come back so that clear message needs to go to all the patient before covid it it was there during covid and you know post covid that is always a risk of flare of the disease so you don't stop your medication you need to discuss your issues with your uh, treating physician or rheumatologist then there were questions that if your drugs are so bad what will happen when if the person gets a covid 19 and so the, all the imaginations were linked to a poor outcome also with the covid 19 and in one year we have learned uh, you know our lessons and the lessons are that uh, whether you get a covid or not is a question because it's a disease where we are all vulnerable but if we have social distancing norms and ideal practices we may not get a covid but if you stop your drugs and say if you are having a gpa where your kidneys are at risk you will have a major organ damage if you stop your drugs and there isn't any risk of getting a worse disease or more covid 19 if you are taking your drugs whether they are immunomodulators or immunosuppressants and then there was another question do my treatments increase the risk of worse disease and the answer is clear cut no the only two things that came to concern was a high dose glucocorticoid and use of rituximab so the fair answer with the covid 19 which has given a you know a good amount of information that we need to continue taking our drugs uh, you know uh, because of our disease they tend to flare up and even if we get some infections uh, we can stop our drugs and mitigate lot of the issues that come up with drugs with infection i think this was uh, uh, really great and very very uh, apt to the context uh, we have right now that is the covid pandemic so so i think it's clear to everybody that um at the doses uh, we use this is modifying drugs they are quite safe and effective and uh, overall if you see that there is no uh, contraindication um for they are not being used or they are being used in the covid pandemic and also uh, i think uh, vimlesh i don't know whether you answered this question or not um you know the vaccinations and the uh, the covid 19 vaccination and the disease modifying drug well, that is a beautiful to- question sir Uh, i will come through that question part because uh, this is very very important uh, every one of us is nowadays busy uh, teaching our patients that we need to vaccinate ourselves uh, if we want to be really safe and people have lot of thought processes whether they can take the vaccine or not so let me summarize and this is the evidence so whatever vaccines that we have as on today they are non live vaccines that cannot give you the viral disease and they cannot transfer infection to you nor can they change your genetic information that is a clear message these vaccines should be used safely in patient with 
they are safe for the patients of various rheumatic diseases and since they are non live uh, they are not going to you know cause much problem to the immune suppressed patients and to say it more strongly there is no reason to withhold these vaccines uh, from the patients of uh, various rheumatic diseases so then comes the guideline that came from ular so the ular guidelines uh, is also available uh, and how they came up with the guideline they said we were previously vaccinating all our patients who were at high risk with pneumococcal and influenza vaccine and we now have sufficient information that they were tolerating well and there were no you know adverse or inappropriate uh, events using using those uh, high safe vaccines that we had so the present vaccines are also in the same league of safe vaccines and do the vaccine interfere with medication the answer is no can i get the vaccination if i take any uh, anti rheumatic or immunosuppressive drugs yes you can and there is another thing that to follow if i ever had a covid 19 and i have recovered should i take vaccine the answer to our patient is yes what about side effects since they are safe vaccines uh, despite it, it being very early uh, we now know that they are quite safe uh, you know we have in india we have vaccinated 1 crore and in america it is around going to be 3 crore population that has been vaccinated uh, do do they will they get a bad or worrying side effects very unlikely will the disease flare if uh, they are vaccinated till now we don't have the data but we have not got early information from various registries that the vaccines have flared various rheumatic diseases uh, what about vaccination is it one time or will they require again and again the answer is probably will require again and again uh, because the strain will change over time so these are the guidelines this is american college of rheumatology guideline they are strongly asking for vaccination and if you go through these guidelines strong strong consensus of vaccinating so coming from uh, this guideline there came very important information how to make these vaccines even better how will they be more you know if uh, effective to our patients and the the answers that they had was if we use hydroxychloroquine ivig or low dose steroid uh, there is no modification if you are using sulfasalazine leflunamide mycophenolate cyclophosphamide oral azathioprine a tnf inhibitors like etanercept or uh, you know adalimumab al6 receptor inhibitors you know a host of drugs no modification Uh, is required however if you are taking methotrexate uh, you need to hold methotrexate one week after each vaccine so you can hold and same is applicable for jack inhibitors so these are the available information coming to abatacept it is said uh, you can hold it a week before and in iv abatacept you can again uh, hold it uh, for sufficient period of time if you are using cyclophosphamide or rituximab you need to hold it uh, you know and plan it accordingly at least a week to one month you know is required for full effect of these drugs to come up so this is how uh, the summary looks like thank you dr vimlesh so i think the take home message is you know the the commonly used anti rheumatic drugs uh, the conventional drugs there is no cause for any worry there is no cause for any worry with low dose steroids for all the other disease categories uh, we encourage our patients and our physicians colleague to actually uh, link with the rheumatologist uh, because there is a global exchange of information on uh, vaccine related problems uh, with for people who have rheumatic diseases so as the scenario is rapidly changing uh, linking with rheumatologist would be a most pragmatic and uh, uh, appropriate uh, sort of you know way forward i would suggest Uh, because the guidelines are also keep uh, changing okay so the next set will uh, discuss few of the important issues related to the surgery and the disease modifying anti rheumatic drug so typically um you know like i has come across that uh, a patient doing well um you know comes back to see me in 4 to 6 months time uh, with a severe disease flare and the reason is that you know because of some surgery uh, whether big or small uh, the medicines were discontinued 
and uh, in some cases uh, the reason was that people simply forgot to restart it uh, and in some they were discontinued for a very long period of time so my first question to rahul is that so, so when surgery is being contemplated uh, from the rheumatologist perspective and from the surgeon's perspective if you can step on uh, their shoes what sort of questions are coming to into our and their mind about the disease modifying drugs so what is it which makes us or our surgeons um you know interfere with the disease modifying antirheumatic therapy rahul yeah. so from surgeon's point of view one is healing uh, there is a dealing delay in healing second is a risk of infection during perioperative period and third for for rheumatologist perspective is a flare of the disease if we stop the uh, medicines there will be a flare of the disease so these three things apart from that the site and the type of operation is also very important like if suppose in orthopedics there is joint replacement is there so anti thrombotic uh, or thromboembolic phenomena should be considered in those situations so these three things are very important one is uh, risk of infection perioperatively second is Uh, delayed healing because of ongoing uh, anti-rheumatic drugs, and third is flare of disease because of modification of the doses or because of stopping of the drug. So, you in routine practice, if patient is on methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, lefunomide, and uh, sulfasalazine, there is no need of stopping the all these drugs. We can continue during or before uh, the surgery and during the surgery and after the surgery, but. uh with lefunomide there is there will be increased chances of uh, infections with lefunomide so we can stop lefunomide but methotrexate hydroxychloroquine should be continued because hydroxychloroquine is having potential of anti thrombotic mechanism so it will reduce the thromboembolic phenomena so hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate should not be stopped though we can stop lefunomide other uh, disease modifying drugs or immunosuppressive drugs like uh, azathioprine and uh, this um, mmf cyclosporine that should be stopped 3 to 5 days before can be continued and when i say common I, of course i mean methotrexate which is uh, the 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 sheet anchor for many rheumatological conditions uh, treatment and then of course um uh the other drugs so so i think you know related to vaccine also we have seen related to this immunomodulator immunosuppressant discussion also we have seen as sort of you know you go uh, to more and more complex drugs um there is more and more thought which needs to be involved and more and more caution so again i would say here that if you come across anybody who is on medication which are not commonly used including cyclophosphamide biological agents whether they are um uh, the small molecules or the you know medicines like rituximab and infliximab i think you know uh, it is important to uh, link with uh, the treating rheumatologist to get an appropriate advice because um by the, the fact that they are on these medication itself means that they have more aggressive disease than than people who are being maintained on low dose steroids with hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate so if you look at the hierarchy of these medicines uh, it should make us think uh, you know twice as much uh, when we put them on this medication when we stop and restart um, you know in the context of surgery thank you rahul that was very good and then um, um i would ask vimlesh to um i think you know just summarize for us uh, that which drugs can be continued and which drugs uh, should be discontinued and and also comment on uh, what to do about the steroids okay um and especially you know i'm talking about scenarios where uh, two different setups you know where somebody has just been uh, you know started on steroids and i expect that you know that dose will be high versus somebody who's been on steroid for some length of time and probably at a low dose so you, those two questions for you vimlesh thank you thank you sir so i have a small again a small presentation so one we should know the half life of the drug 
So for example, DMARTs, if you know that the, what is the various half-life, you can under, understand and you can plan. The brief understanding is that, that there are not too many available information other than the orthopedic surgeries that most of our patients undergo. So we know all the data and extrapolation of data. So methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, leflunamide, you know, they can be continued. And I will add on because there are data which changed over time. And it is said that cyclosporine, azathioprine, mycophenolate, you need to stop a week or more prior to initiating this drug. I just require. So now, so there are various types of surgeries also we will come through. Now coming to biologicals, if you know the half-life of a drug, say etanercept, it's around five and a half days. So if you want to plan a surgery, and I would ideally like to do a surgery when the disease is well controlled. So if I have to plan my patient who requires etanercept to control the disease, uh, I need to first get the disease in a you know, low state before I do the surgery because the surgical outcome is also better. So in a planned surgery with the biological agents, there are various uh, uh, you know, a timeline in which we need to follow. So for etanercept, a 10 days prior to surgery is, is considered to be safe enough. And for adalumab, which has a, ha a higher half-life, we require around 30 days. And for infliximab, again, the half-life is between etanercept and adalumab, you require 90 days. So this is how you take in consideration. Now, moving forward, there are certain surgeries. So patients of a rheumatoid, because of you know, past intake of steroid, they get a lot of ophthalmic complications, say cataract. And if they are on a low-dose steroid, you don't stop the steroid at all. Because of a chronic nature of steroid use, your pituitary uh, you know, hypothalamus and uh, the axis, adrenal axis is actually uh, is, uh, you know, deranged and you require a minimal amount of steroid if it is for a prolonged period of time. So we actually require to give steroid even on the day of surgery. For example, if you have a small surgical stress, uh, giving a 25 milligram of hydrocortisone or cortisone IV prior to the you know, surgery on the same day early morning is considered to be uh, useful. Otherwise, the patients may have a drop in blood pressures and other complications. So we need to understand chronic use of steroid. No need of stopping it, but bring it down to the lowest possible limit where your uh, you know, adrenal insufficiency is not precipitated. You also need to know certain anti inflammatory drugs that you take uh, in states, diseases like ankylosing spondylitis. So you need to stop certain drugs, you know, in a time frame. Say naproxen, you need to stop three days prior, otherwise you will have more bleeding chances. Uh, for ibuprofen and diclofenac, you require around 10 hours. And if you are, the patient has been on a COX inhibitor, you need to maintain the usual dose even on that day of surgery. So these are a few things that we need to take in consideration. Great. I think that was very, very useful um, summary of uh, the discussion which we intended to do. Uh, the, the drugs which can be stopped uh, should be continued and when uh, is the time to do so. Um, and for the last uh, section, um, just you know, uh, one question to each of the panelists. Uh, first to Rahul, and I'm combining two questions over here. Um, so the pregnancy, lactation, and disease-modifying drugs, this is also uh, an area of confusion where the lot, lots of drugs are discontinued. Um, and when we see patients and then when they go back to the periphery, become pregnant, um, so the confusion can arise at that time and subsequently during any time uh, in the pregnancy and, of course, during the lactation where the medic medications can be discontinued and it can lead to disease flare or worsening. So, uh, Rahul, if you could just summarize for us, you know, what drugs can be, uh, what conventional disease modifying drugs can be safely used throughout the pregnancy and lactation? And also, uh, you know, your advice about the steroids in pregnancy and lactation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, sulfasalazine, and azathioprine. These three drugs are safe during conception, uh, uh, during pregnancy and lactation. 
Sometimes during lactation, azathioprine also transfer from uh, milk through milk to the baby. So that has to be uh, like consider the things, and we should do the counts of the baby during that period. Otherwise, these three drugs are very safe during pregnancy and lactation. Methotrexate, lefnormide, these are uh, absolute contraindication is there. And regarding anti-TNF therapy, anti-TNF therapy is safe during pregnancy, even during lactation. And rituximab and other biologics are not safe. And regarding this uh, small molecules, there is no data of safety. So we can't comment on that, but it is better to hold with all these small molecules during the pregnancy. And especially for steroids, steroids, the safety of steroids depends on two things. One is how much dose is there, like if it is less than 20 milligram and uh, if it is more than 20 milligram. So first of all, uh, we should keep the dose below 20 milligram uh, of the equivalent of prednisolone. And there are two conditions during pregnancy. One is uh, treatment of uh, mother and treatment of baby uh, uh, during pregnancy in cases of APLA. In those cases, steroid should be uses of fluorinated steroids like betamethasone, dexamethasone, because that uh, penetrate the placenta. So during that situation, betamethasone or dexamethasone are safer as, and appropriate for that condition as compared to prednisolone. If we want to treat mother, then we use prednisolone. If we want to treat baby, then we use we should use fluorinated steroids. Thank you, Rahul. I think that's very important. And so, so it's not like you know when uh, they are contemplating pregnancy um, uh, or have become or have fallen pregnant, uh, there is no sort of you know medication. As Dr. Rahul has said, uh, when they are on sulfasalazine, as a and hydroxychloroquine, and with low dose of steroids, uh, in most scenarios, uh, they can be continued without any problems whatsoever. Um, regarding, so I got two questions from uh, to, to Vimlesh. Uh, one is, um, Dr. Rahul has touched upon that. So, uh, so by far, methotrexate is the most common used medication in uh, rheumatology practice. So you can take it that, you know, they will be on methotrexate or lufulonamide uh, when they are contemplating uh, pregnancy. So uh, sort of, you know, what advice you would give to a couple who are contemplating pregnancy um, and one of them are uh, you know, uh, on either lufulonamide or methotexate. And the second question is, uh, you know, give us a summary of biologicals which can be used, uh, um, you know, uh, in the pregnancy and lactation. And with that, we'll end this uh, panel discussion. The broad guideline would be taking care of the disease first. We don't want a lady to be pregnant while the disease is active. That message should be loud and clear for all the diseases, various rheumatic diseases. Only when she is fit enough, she should plan pregnancy. And it's our role to get the optimum dr drugs, optimum dosage, so that they are brought down into low disease, possible or remission. Then follow the guidelines and that active discussion that, okay, you we start at methotrexate, say 20 milligram, we are giving hydroxychloroquine. And yes, the discussion of Pregnancy has started coming up. Okay, I may add a sulfasalazine because at that maybe say three to six months of last follow up, you are doing fine. I'm going to slowly stop or slowly take it off and continue with hydroxy. This is a you know broad guideline that we discuss and we all do it. But what they need to understand is there are certain drugs which are uh, you know not at all allowed with the pregnancy, say leflunamide and methotrexate. So it should be a planned pregnancy and not an accident because it puts that in a very uh, problematic, uh, you know, where you have emotional requirement or that the, as a doctor that the lady is looking forward to expand family. And there is a medical science which says there can be harm to the baby. So looking into the harm again, some slides need to be understood well. Uh, we need to discuss with our patients. So... Again, all these uh, guidelines has evolved. So maybe sometime back we had a different guidelines. So FDA pregnancy categories 
And this was quite, quite clear by 2012 uh, and 13 that you can use certain drugs which are in the B category. And if you see, hydroxychloroquine is C. They were not very sure because they felt that the, the fetus ophthalmic complication may be still there, but they were quite happy with NSAIDs, corticosteroids, sulfasalazine, and TNF inhibitors. However, they were concerned of vectoral abnormalities. There were certain drugs which were X category, not to be used. They were methotrexate, leflunamide. Some of the drugs, like azathioprine, were categorized in the D category, so it was not safe. Tofacitinib was in the C, tocilizumab in C, so inadequate data. This was how it happened. But then the summary started coming up and the information uh, gathering mechanism became bit better. So there are certain drugs which you can continue during lactation. They include NSAIDs, steroids, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfasalazine. Then there are inadequate data, but you can continue in lactation because if a patient who is having angst bond is, doing, is not doing good, she requires a TNF inhibitors to maintain. Otherwise, she will not be able to take care of herself and the child. So TNF inhibitors uh, can be given. And if pressing needs are there, you can even go on to give tofacitinib or tocilizumab or rituximab. So they are broadly categorized in a way where the patient's requirement is also looked into. And there were certain drugs which were contraindicated during lactation, which included azathioprine. Now move forward. What happened? Again, a new sets of uh, guidelines came up. Uh, they came up in 2016 and 17, and they said, uh, don't worry, steroids, they are good for preconception. It is good in first trimester. It's good in the second and the third trimester. It's compatible with breastfeeding, and it is compatible with paternal exposure also. So that myth about steroid at various stages of pregnancy was taken care of. What about hydroxychloroquine? Yes, or take marks in all the stages. What about methotrexate? Need to stop three months in advance. So you need to plan it out. And then it was not compatible with breastfeeding or any other. What about sulfasalazine? All yes, you can give it before conception, during conception, and while you are lactating. So it can be given. If the patient is on leflunamide, try to bring down the leflunamide uh, in the body by chelating it by cholestramine. And then only you can plan it. So again, this was something that came up. What about azathioprine? There was a controversy. They said now that azathioprine at a dosage less than 2 milligram per kilogram is safe. Vimlesh. Yes, sir. Uh, just uh, summarize, you know. we. So, okay. In a, in a minute. <laughs> Not more than 30 seconds. What about TN, uh, TNF inhibitors? Uh, you can give all the TNF inhibitors till second trimester. Uh, you can give in the third trimester only one spe special type of TNF inhibitor which is not available, which is cetolizumab. And in the biologicals, rituximab and tocilizumab, again, you need to, uh, you know, to take care that they should not be given, uh, you know, uh, near pregnancy. So that's it. I think two important things from uh, Dr. Bimlesh's uh, discussion related to this particular topic. Uh, one is uh, the pregnancy should always be planned. And most of um, the patients, you know, we would see would be in, you know, uh, I mean, at least a good proportion will be in the childbearing age. So it is important to keep thinking of these issues related to the pregnancy, um, uh, you know, in the initial phases of planning your treatment. Uh, discuss uh, the risks and benefits of the therapies with them. If they are on methotrexate three months before contemplating pregnancy, and if they are on leflonomide one year before contemplating pregnancy, they had to be stopped. And the emergency measures should be also. But I think the most important uh, thing I want to highlight is that as regards to the surgery or the immunomodulator immunosuppressant discussion we had, and again, you know, here I would advise that if you have any confusion related to which medication should continue and which should not continue where the dose redu reduction is required or which medicine can be used during a particular phase of the pregnancy. Uh, I think, you know, a dialogue between the treating obstetrician um, and the rheumatologist is extremely important. And the other reason to say so is that Dr. Wimblesh has shown how the, on the, on the, on the phase of, uh, you know, accumulation of evidence, the guidelines 
has also evolved over a period of time and right now you know in the last 3 to 6 months we have acr guidelines which clearly says that you know you can use adalumumab or etanzeb safely and also um, um you know um uh, some of the other drugs uh, you know it just strengthens their uh, safety during the all three phases of pregnancy So with that, I would like to thank my fellow panelist and uh, organizing secretary, Dr. Mohit, and our patrons, uh, the Bomb Sir and Kumawat Sir, and all the audience, um, and and the speakers uh, uh, before us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravinder, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Jain, and uh, I now like to invite uh, the chairman of the API Udaipur chapter, Professor Dr. B. S. Bomb Sir. to kindly uh, provide us expert comments on the proceedings that have gone uh, on during today sir you have to unmute yourself yes sir hello yes sir i am audible yes sir respected dr vinod ravindran the coordinator and very learned other rheumatologists dr vimlesh dhar dr rahul jain himanshu and rajkiran and the my friend dr professor dr d c kumawat dr mohit goyal the organizer at the outset on behalf of api i would like to thank dr mohit goyal and dr vinod ramendram the coordinator for planning such a beautiful cme on rheumatological parks the all the topics selected were excellent very useful for all the internists we have learned a lot from the cme in very short time the message given by dr sham was very clear that is number 1 for clinician that is when you diagnose or come across a case of polyarthritis your clinical judgment is the super that is the one thing that is before in ordering for investigation or relying on investigation what is your pre investigative diagnosis on clinical ground it's much more important than relying on the laboratory data that is very right that the, the that laboratory data may not be the 100% for diagnostic for any disease and secondly that follow the patient it is the courts will decide the future diagnosis and then we come across the polyarthritis follow them that a rheumatologist is an internist an internist that is also a rheumatologist because in india we do not have the so many rheumatologists so the internist have to cater the need of rheumatologists they have to be very vast with rheumatology part and the thorough systemic examination is very vital for diagnosing the rheumatological disorder and when coming to the monoarthritis the topic dealt by dr raj kiran was excellent and is given the beautiful idea about the inflammatory causes and infective causes and gout and the osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis the spondyl arthritis presenting in monoarthritis the topic chosen by or talked by the himadasa himanshu on low back ache gave many clues about the diagnosis and the most important thing is when a physician come across a case of low back ache don't miss the diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy because that is treatable and that if we pick up early we can prevent the deformity we can treat so that is very important and home going message for the clinician when coming to the panel discussion was wonderful 
and the home going maxis was very clear that is if a fertile couple wants to having rheumatoid arthritis that is having rheumatoid arthritis it should be a plan plan pregnancy mm. nothing else that is you have to first control the disease activity you have to choose the right drug if the patient is in the child bearing age mm. and if they are want to have a pregnancy that is avoid lefunamide avoid methotrexate because they are teratogenic the safer drug they have mentioned very beautifully that is uh, hydroxychloroquine is safe sulfa salazin is safe and when we come to the other drug we can use the low dosage of azathioprine or cyclosporine or with the consent and with the guidance of rheumatologist the other biologists learn lactation also we have to be careful so the all the participants they have done a wonderful job that is the panelist dr vimlesh dar dr rahul and dr vinod they did their job excellently them nicely and very educative panel discussion so once again i thank dr mohit goel dr vinod ravindram and all the three very brilliant other rheumatologists dr vimlesh dar dr rahul uh, jain dr himanshu raj kiran and dr sham and the of course the my organizing secretary of the raj uh, the rajasthan udaipur chapter of uh, api dr dc professor dr dc kumar and all the delegates who participate i think that with the participation of the internists the we will be when all the internists they will be benefited and the the, the whatever we have learned this uh, and the benefit will go to the patient thank you very much for patient hearing thank you once again to the organizers and all of you thank you so much sir uh, i uh, i i don't think this vote of thanks can start from anywhere uh, without first thanking the active participation of the delegates uh, we all were pondering whether we have reached a saturation stage as far as virtual cmes and online meetings are concerned but the uh, attendance today has been extremely encouraging and we would all the faculty api as well as myself would like to thank all the participants i'd like like to thank the api udaipur chapter professor bom sir who always so kindly uh, kindly with a smile on his face agrees to all my academic meetings and uh, he, he has his uh, very pertinent points that he makes about uh, what goes on in the meetings uh dr Pro professor dr kumawat sir uh, secretary who again so willingly uh, gives us all the permissions and makes things so easy uh, the faculty today uh, they have been extremely uh, helpful extremely supportive they have all taken out time uh, it's raining webinars uh, this covid season but they all have taken out their time uh, firstly uh, dr vinod ravindran sir who also helped me chalk out the scientific program for this meeting uh dr rahul jain sir from jaipur he has always been such a constant and strong support for me uh dr bimlesh dhar pande uh, i can say uh, he is my mentor in rheumatology uh dr sham from chennai uh, again a senior uh, that i would always look for help to again i my guide uh, dr himanshu pathak and uh, dr raj kiran uh, ever dynamic and ever supportive Uh, with that I, i would also like to thank our uh, industry partners the academic partners alchem uh, concord ipca solmars and zidas team ipca uh, who did a splendid job with organizing this online meeting i would like to thank you all and thank you so much we we'll look forward to having you again uh, may probably face to face the next time thank you thank you Oh yes. Thank you so much sir.